Hello and welcome to Tea with Tolkien, an online community for the Hobbit at Heart. We are inspired by the works, life, and Catholic faith of J.R.R. Tolkien, and strive to encourage others towards a deeper love and understanding of Tolkien's Legendarium by hosting a free book club, providing free resources such as our Silmarillion Reader's Guide, and by cultivating a vibrant and positive community online. Our book club is currently reading The Fall of Numenor. If you'd like to join in on the discussion, you can sign up for our free book club at teawithtolkien.com slash book dash club. For the sake of this book club, I've broken the fall of Numenor down into 10 sections, so this week we will be covering the fifth section. This video contains my notes from this section, as well as the recap of our live chat that occurred in our Discord server. This week we are covering Aldarion and Arendis Part 2, The Wedding of Aldarion and Arendis, and The Accession of Tar Aldarion, which is pages 83 through 114, and it covers about the year 870 through approximately 1000 of the Second Age. The Wedding of Aldarion and Arendis In the year 870, the Wedding of Aldarion and Arendis occurred in Armenalos. After their wedding, they rode through the Isle, and at the end of this period of time, they came to Andunie for the last feast which was attended by some of the Eldar. There is a mention of the Eleanor flower in this section, which is significant in The Lord of the Rings because this flower grew in Lothlorien, and because Sam Gamgee named his daughter after it, so I thought that was a fun mention. East, the Eldar bring a couple of gifts for Aldarion and Arendis. For Aldarion, they give a sapling tree, and Aldarion immediately is super dumb, and he is like, oh, this is such a cool tree, this must be great for wood, to which the elves reply, um, well, we wouldn't know because no one has ever done that before. Like, you can tell they're uh, a little bit irritated by that, as you should be. And for Arendis, they give a pair of songbirds. Tolkien writes, let them fly and be free, answered the Eldar, for we have spoken to them and named you, and they will stay wherever you dwell. They mate for life, and that is long. Maybe there will be many such birds to sing in the gardens of your children. So after this, Aldarion and Arendis returned to live in Armenalos. In 873, their daughter Ankalime is born. Arendis was glad that their first child was a girl so that she might be able to keep Aldarion near enough to conceive a son. Um, she continued to be jealous of the sea, refusing to go with him upon his ship. Tolkien writes, For in secret she still feared the sea and its power upon his heart, and though she strove to hide it and would talk with him of his old ventures and of his hopes and designs, she watched jealously if he went to his house ship or was much with adventurers. To Aambar, Aldarion once asked her to come. But seeing swiftly in her eyes that she was not full willing, he never oppressed her again. Now, in this time, Aldarion remained in Numenor for a while, where he was a responsible forester. However, Arendis was still resentful of him because Aldarion didn't love trees for themselves, but only so far as they could be used for timber. And this dynamic between their relationship reminds me a lot of Aule and Yavanna. Aldarion built a great ship like a castle. And when Ankalime was nearly four years old, Aldarion confessed his desire to set sail once again, and he intended that he would only be gone for two years. He left shortly after her birthday, which is something that Ankalime never forgot. Tolkien writes, he lifted up Ankalime and kissed her, but though she clung to him, he set her down quickly and rode off. It's also noted in this section that according to Numenorean culture, Aldarion did not remain in his house long enough after his daughter's birth to be ideal and kind of socially acceptable. So it was pretty commonly agreed that he left too soon. He left without the blessing of the king or the bow of return from Arendis. And in this time, as he's leaving, Arendis becomes extremely cold and bitter. Tolkien writes, All that day Arendis sat in her chamber alone, grieving, but deeper in her heart she felt a new pain of cold anger, and her love for Aldarion was wounded to the quick. In this time, Arendis left Armenalos and dwelt in Amerie with her daughter, and she nurtured her with bitterness against men. She also dismissed her elven birds, telling them this was no place for such joy as theirs. The elven birds flew to her parents' house, and 
this is how her parents were able to know that Aldarion had left. And after this, the birds flew home to Arisea. So that's a highly symbolic moment there. When the time for Aldarion to return came, Menaldor summoned Arendis to Armenalos to await his arrival, and she prepared their home in Armenalos, but she wouldn't come herself, saying, Will the king have me wait upon the quays like a sailor's lass? Would that I were, but I am so no longer. I have played that part to the full. And kind of as she suspected, Aldarion did not return at this time, and she became even more bitter and silent. She shut their house in Armenalos, and remained in Amarie, and she became even more obsessed with her daughter. She wouldn't allow her to leave her side, and um, their house was very quiet and hushed, Tolkien writes, as if one had died there not long since. When Ancalime was seven years old, she saw a boy for essentially the first time, and this exchange I think is extremely funny. What noisy thing was that, said Ancalime. A boy, said Zamin, if you know what that is, but how should you? They're breakers and eaters, mostly. So you can see, um, as that quote kind of illustrates, what kind of environment she was raised in and how she was, even from a young age, fed with this bitterness towards men and boys and just a general disdain for them. It's also in this time that she began to ask questions about her father, who she had pretty much forgotten about. She asks her mom, when will she come back? She's asking her mom, when will he come back? Which is a natural question to ask your mother. And Arendis' response is horrible. She says, do not ask me, said Arendis. I do not know. Never, perhaps. But do not trouble yourself, for you have a mother, and she will not run away while you love her. Like, she's just, that's a terrible thing to say to a child. So in year 882 of the Second Age, when Ancalime is nine years old, Aldarion returned, and word was sent to Amarie of his arrival, but Arendis didn't go to greet him, and she didn't even tell Ancalime An about it. So she doesn't even know her dad's back. Um, Aldarion goes to Meneldor and um, talks to him about the happenings in Middle-earth, and he's returned bringing news that a shadow has fallen upon men, and he has a letter from King Gilgalad of the Elves. Menaldor urges Aldarion to return home to deal with his own affairs before concerning himself with Middle-earth, which I think is, is pretty valid. Aldarion confesses, however, he would have returned home if he would have known where his home was, because when he returned to Numenor, his house in Armenalos is shut, and there's no word, there's no messenger, and so he doesn't even know where his family is. And so Menaldor tells him, your family is in, in Amarie, and he leaves and heads, heads back over there at once. When he returns and arrives in Amarie, he receives a cold welcome, and he perceived then that he no longer had a wife. Tolkien writes, I was told in Armenalos that my wife was here and had removed my daughter hither, he answered. As to the wife, I am mistaken, it seems. But have I not a daughter? And Arendis responds, You had one some years ago, but my daughter has not yet risen. The next morning, Aldarion plans to leave after speaking to Aunt Kalime, and he reminds her that she is the daughter of the king's heir, and then he just leaves. After he left, Arendis weeps because she had hoped that he would apologize despite how awfully she treated him, I mean, she had kind of hoped in the, you know, the corners of her heart that they could be reconciled, but she didn't really do anything to move them towards that point, so both of them have kind of shut each other out and it's kind of like they've reached the point of no return. Aldarion rides to the house of Halatan, where he gives a jewel to Ulbar's wife as repayment for all the time he had kept her husband from her, and then after this, he rides to Armenalos alone, where he goes to talk to Menaldor about the letter from Gilgalad. In this letter, Gilgalad is asking for the king's pardon for detaining Aldarion, and he's talking about a new shadow which is arising in the east, a servant of Morgoth is stirring. Gilgalad is requesting Numenor's aid for defending Middle-earth. And Menaldor is really troubled by this letter. He doesn't really know how to respond to it. It's kind of in his mind either way, whether he chooses to, to reach out and help and to prepare for war, or if he chooses to take a more passive route, there are issues with each choice. And so ultimately he decides to resign the scepter to Aldarion sooner than he had intended so that he could decide how to handle this since he's kind of more educated 
in this um, entire situation since he's actually been to Middle Earth several times and has this existing relationship with Gilgalad. The Accession of Tar Aldarion, 883, Tar Aldarion becomes the sixth king of Numenor. From this point forward, the narrative becomes fragmented because Tolkien didn't finish it entirely. However, Christopher Tolkien editorialized the remaining notes under the title, The Further Course of the Narrative. So in 883, Aldarion returned to Middle-earth once more, very shortly after having become king. He didn't place a bow on his ship, but instead an image of an eagle with a golden beak, which had been a gift from Círdan. It's also noted in this time that he met Galadriel, though it doesn't really say much else about their interactions. There is no conclusion given to Gilgalad's request for aid. Tolkien writes, Aldarion was too late, or too early. Too late for the power that hated Numenor had already waked. Too early for the time was not yet ripe for Numenor to show its power, or to come back into battle for the world. Tolkien writes, Tar Aldarion caused the law of succession in Numenor to be changed. It is said specifically that Tar Aldarion did this for reasons of private concern rather than policy, and out of his long resolve to defeat Arendis. The New Law a female descendant of the king may inherit the scepter if he had no son. She would be free to refuse, and then the scepter would then pass to the nearest male kinsman. A female heir must resign if she remained unwed by a certain time. At some point, Aldarion rescinded this provision. And then it also included that the king's heir should not marry outside the line of Elros. Of Ancalime She was proclaimed the king's heir at 19. She had been long nurtured against men and was accustomed to the society of women and, in general, found men irritating. She had approved of her mother's treatment of Aldarion as well as Aldarion's treatment of her mother. So she was able to see both sides and um, she was kind of sympathetic to each of them. Tolkien writes she was clever and malicious and saw promise of sport as the prize for which her mother and father did battle. Ankalime profoundly disliked obligatory marriage, and she did not desire love, but she did ultimately marry Halakar after he sought her out in the borders of the lands of Halatan. They had a son named Inarion, but she withheld him from her husband, and she would also not allow her servants, who were all women, to be married. However, Tolkien does give us this story about her husband arranging a secret marriage feast for them, and Ankalime was humiliated at this, and afterwards she never came back to Amarie, and she deeply hated her husband afterwards. The Death of Arendis When Arendis was old, she missed Aldarion, and she began the journey to Remena, um, where she ultimately passed away. There's not a lot of information about her death, but Tolkien writes, There it seems she met her fate, but only the words, Arendis perished in the water, the year 985 remain to suggest how it came to pass. So as this section wraps up, Tolkien ends it by saying, Of the lifespan granted to the Numenorians, Arendis had once said that women became a kind of imitation elves, and their men had so much in their heads and desire of doing that they never felt the pressure of time, and so seldom rested or rejoiced in the present. Fortunately, their wives were cool and busy, but Numenor was no place for great love. So just recapping the timeline for this section. Year 870, the marriage of Aldarion and Arendis. 873, Ancalame is born. 892, Ancalame is declared heiress to the throne. 985, Arendis dies after journeying to Romena. Now let's talk about what we discussed in our book club chat. Aldarion's motives for his journeys. While Aldarion clearly feels a responsibility to help, as he's begun to become acquainted with the situation unfolding in Middle-earth, he's also motivated by the sea longing which holds a really strong grip on his heart. It's clear that he's most comfortable among the venturers where he is held in high esteem, rather than in the presence of his father who is continually trying to re redirect him, or his wife who resents his passions. We also talked about the letter that is being read from Gilgalad. From the perspective of someone who hasn't read the Silmarillion, it is unclear exactly what the shadow Gilgalad refers to is really talking about. Um, interestingly, this puts the reader in the same position as Meneldor, who is just learning about all of this for the first time. Nobody is really aware that the shadow which is stirring is actually Sauron yet. 
Gilgalad seems to think that Meneldor knows what's going on in Middle Earth, according to his letter, just by the way it's written, um, when Aldarion hasn't actually told him anything. So that's kind of on Aldarion for his poor communication. Focus on Numenor in this section. The section focuses so closely on the narrative of Numenor, and we aren't exposed to a lot of what's going on in Middle-earth until the letter, so we are just, just as surprised as Meneldor, which I think creates an interesting experience for the reader. The Unhappy Marriage of Aldarion and Arendis Sea of Glass commented that they each married an illusion, only seeing what they wanted to see, which I thought was a really good way of putting it. Aldarion is disappointed that Arendis doesn't fight back when he sends her the letter. A lot of this section puts us in Arendis's shoes because we aren't really getting very much of Aldarion's perspective. We're actually primarily seeing what her life is like without him and not getting a ton of information about what his life is like without her. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, it seems like Tolkien is kind of setting this up purposefully to show that these are two people who are not willing to compromise themselves in order to make a healthy marriage, which requires compromise. So who is at fault? I feel like that's something that comes up a lot with Aldarion and Arendis, like the need to take sides. I think choosing a side is difficult because they're both at fault for different reasons. I think it's unreasonable of Arendis to ask Aldarion to give up something that he's so passionate about, especially because she knew about his sea longing before they were married. But Aldarion is also being very neglectful of the duties that he was given in life, both his family and the kingdom. I think a common theme in Tolkien's stories is the desire to seek for more than what you're given, like what your lot in life is. And Aldarion recognizes that he needed to take action for the future of Numenor, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it should have been him going to Middle-earth. He could have delegated that as the king. And I think um, when you do have a family, they become your primary responsibility, even if you are the king. Um, it's kind of on you to care for your own children, especially. Could anything have kept Aldarion in Numenor? Personally, I don't think so, and that's kind of the consensus that our group came to. It's not like giving him a happy marriage or a different wife would have would have allowed him to stay. Um, this seems to be something that was like a part of Aldarion's soul, his desire to be out on the sea um, ever since his first journey. So um, it doesn't really seem like there was really much hope of keeping him in Numenor like that, and I don't think that's kind of what he was meant to do. We also talked a bit about Meneldor's monologue. We see him wrestling with this internal conflict, asking himself, should I prepare my people for war? It seems like all choices are wrong, whether to arm people who may become addicted to fighting or to not arm them and leave them unprepared. And I think this in a lot of ways, is a reflection of Tolkien's own struggle and his feelings about warfare. And it also reminded me a lot of Aragorn in The Lord of the Rings when he feels like every choice that he's making or every option is wrong. So I thought that was kind of interesting because, as we know, Aragorn is a descendant of Numenor, and so you kind of see a similar struggle, an internal struggle, um, over the ages. We also talked about Arendis's death. It's very mysterious. Do we think it was an accident or do we think it was suicide? We had a lot of debate about these two possibilities. Ultimately, Tolkien leaves this question unanswered, but I tend to lean against the thought that she committed suicide um, just because it says that she had specifically gone to seek out Aldarion, and it seems to imply that she was on her way to make amends with him. And it was also speculated whether we think Lenin is related to her death in any way, and personally, I don't. I don't think so. The Valar, the Maiar, the, the Maiar aren't like, like she's not a, a, a siren who's going to kind of lure sailors to their death. I don't think we have any reason to believe that Uinen would um, do something like that. It seemed kind of out of her character. Um, all it says about Arendis' death is that she perished in the water. So one way or another, she drowned. Whether or not it was intentional, we don't really know. Um, but it was kind of fun to discuss that amongst ourselves and kind of have a little debate. The last topic of discussion was just back to this idea of personal interpretations. This is a really personal story because it deals with marriage, which is something that a lot of people are um, a participant of, whether you're in a marriage of your own, whether your parents were married and you've kind of seen it from their perspective. Um, marriage is just something that's 
a core part of a lot of people's lives. And so you're going to bring your own interpretations and experiences with marriage into the story. And so it does become very personal. And I thought it was really interesting. It's such a different story than what we normally get from Tolkien. And so while it was really difficult to read just because it was so sad, I really enjoyed it. And I hope you all did too. So next week, we will be talking about part six of the fall of Numenor, starting with year 1000. And we've got some super exciting things going on. We've got some rings to make. So I will see you next week for part six of the fall of Numenor. Thank you.